abdominal cramps, lower back pain, headaches, insomnia, and mood swings. These are just some of the performance hindering symptoms that female athletes face during their menstrual cycle. Good afternoon, I'm Rashika Grant, one of your moderators for the inaugural Women's Health and Athletic Performance Forum. Welcome to the first session of this forum. Every year, pre-COVID, we have gathered in stadiums, arenas, and around our devices to cheer on our female athletes as they made their school and country proud in various sporting disciplines. In today's forum, we'll speak about an issue that has affected all of our favorite female athletes, the menstrual cycle and how it impacts their athletic performance. In today's session, there'll be two, in today's forum, there'll be two sessions, each an hour long, with each panelist presenting for 15 minutes, followed by a question and answer section. There are two panelists in the first session, namely Olympian Natoya Gould and team doctor to the record girls, Dr. Gillian Lawrence, while sports administrator, Risa Grant, coach Michael Vassell, and sport journalist Shoshana McGowan will be representing in the second session. The question and answer session will follow the second panelist presentation. You can tweet to the Drive Phase JA or put your questions in the YouTube chat. We will try to answer as many as possible. Before I introduce our first presenter, let me just say, if any material in this forum may cause a trigger and, cause, and can potentially cause emotional, psychological, or negative effects on you, please feel free to exit the forum and seek professional help or guidance from any professional organizations in your area. Once again, thank you for joining us. And we have a dynamic set of presenters who will be sharing with us and sharing with us their perspective on this very important issue. And we hope that we'll all leave this forum with more awareness and also a way forward for our female athletes. Our first panelist is Olympian and Jamaica's 800 meter record holder, Natalia Gould. Natalia has became a local favorite at a very tender age after becoming a, a champion at the, high, the Boys and Girls High School Championships. She has represented Jamaica at four World Athletics Championships and the Olympics. In 2019, Natalia spoke about her own experiences with the impact of period on her athletic performance and has since been an advocate for the issue becoming a priority, not just for female athletes, but for stakeholders in the industry as they support female athletes. Over to you, Natalia. Hello, I'm Natalia Gould. It is quite an honor being here in your presence. Now, let's talk about female athletes and menstrual cycle. Here is why. We do this to create a safe space for women's health and athletic performances. Now, let's talk about balancing periods with high performance. It is always necessary to analyze the symptoms, the traits, and the effects. What are the, some of the symptoms you may ask that I experience? Symptoms such as back pain, belly pain, for some it might be headaches and even more symptoms. Traits such as unhealthy diet, increase in appetite, which for me is mostly an increase in appetite. Effects such as fatigue, bloating, performance decrease, and oftentimes weight gain, one may also experience iron deficiency. These, however, may vary based on each individual. I want to also speak about birth control. Birth control can have different effects on different individuals, but for me, it had a negative impact. I can remember back in 2015 when I first went on birth control because I did not want to have you know, regular periods because of belly pain. And I remember running back um, in an indoor meet back in 2015, and I ran and I didn't feel like myself anymore because I started, you know, being on birth control after running 201 back in March. I decided that I will go on birth control after I just finished because of not wanting to have regular periods. So when I do went on birth control, I started to have a negative, it started to have a negative impact on me. And I started running and I always feel sluggish, always feel tired. And I'm like, what is going on? I even went conference, even though I won, it was not to my full potential. I went to regionals and I was struggling running two or three. 
And I also went nationals that year of 2015, which was my last year in the NCAA. And I lost the 800 meters just because of being on birth control. And at that time, um, you know, persons will always say, because they don't know what happens, you know, just seeing you out there running all the time, they don't know really what happens with you. So at that time, I was on birth control when I lost NCAA. And I decided after NCAA that I will um, get off um, birth control. And for me, when I was on birth control, I, I gained weight, even though you don't really see it on me because I am very slim. I gain weight in my breast because it store a lot of water whenever you know you go on birth control. And two weeks after that, I went to the Jamaica trials and I was able to run 159.6. And that is like, I felt extremely lighter because of you know getting off the birth control. I also had mood swings. And for me, persons who know me personally know that I can be very miserable at times. And imagine me, you know, having mood swings because of birth control, then that is not pretty. And I think that I become someone that I was not. But how do we, you know, um, identify iron deficiency? Because I know because of the birth control, after getting off, I lose a lot of iron. And I, I will define it as unusual tiredness, higher level of fatigue, also tend to feel drowsy more often than usual, as well as anemic depression, shortness of breath and dizziness. For me, it was fatigue, you know, and it was anemic and probably a little bit of depression too, because I'm like, I don't know what is going on with my body. So that can have you depressed. And here it, is it is important to have a healthy iron intake. Iron is one of the main components in the blood as it provides oxygen. As you know, we experience major blood loss as athletes and even as women during our cycle, approximately about 220 to 250 mg per pint over about two to five days. And for some athletes, it may be for more than five days, even weeks. So imagine you as an athlete up to lose blood for such a long period of time you lose a lot of iron and for me as an 800 runner I lose tremendous iron by just even running miles and miles and I do about 50 something or more miles per week so imagine me not being able to fuel myself back with iron then I lose a lot of iron and even with uh, another story back in 2016, when I first realized that I lost, you know, that I lose iron, that it was me running 800 meters at the New York meet back in um, New York. And I was running and I was feeling sluggish. And I was like, why am I feeling this way? I run 204. And I'm like, I haven't run 204 indoors in years. And my coach was like, what is going on with you? I'm like, coach, I don't know what is going on with me. And then I went to World Indoors and, you know, I got bones while I was running the 800 meters and that triggered off everything. And I ended up running 208 and also came dead last, you know, and I was like, I really don't know what is going on. And my coach keep on asking me, what is going on, goal? And I coach, I don't know. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna run something shorter, which was a 400 meters. So my first outdoor meet, I went, I ran a 400 meters and I almost run 55 seconds. And I was like, no goal. Something definitely wrong with your goal because 55 seconds, you haven't run that since high school. Every time you run, you run 53 yards faster for your 400 meters, your first 400 meters. And so my coach told me, you know, you know, it's best to go and do a blood test. So I went and do a blood test and lo and behold, my result came back and it was in the twenties, which was super low for, you know, an athlete. And from there on, I was able to, you know, have a solution. So there are different solutions for iron deficiency. 
Now, iron intake may vary based on a variety of things. It can be individual events. Like I said, the 800 meters is what I run. So it can be different um, individual iron level or as recommended by your healthcare physician. Here is what is always recommended for athletes. About 65 mg is recommended daily, or it can be different recommendation based on who you are and the, the, the as I said, your, your healthcare physician. There are different ways you can increase your iron level. For me, I use liquid iron. You can also use iron pills or your daily diet meals such as oatmeal. I don't really like oatmeal, but it is a good uh, you know, meal that you can use um, on a daily basis. You can also eat fish. You can also eat liver, spinach, seeds and nuts, and also various red meats. Now, symptoms maintenance. Now, these symptoms as well varies, and there are different recommend recommended methods on how to maintain these symptoms and maintain a high performance during menstrual cycle. So for me, belly pain and back pain, I have used painkillers. I've also used menstrual heated wraps and lower back and hip eat, eat wraps to ease the pain for me, but that may vary for individuals. They might have other solutions, but those are things that I use. So for me, my last menstrual cycle was about two weeks or three weeks ago. And I remember, you know, the day before and the day off, I was feeling pain. So I took two painkillers, which is Advil. I used the liquid gel and I took two painkillers. And while I was warming up, I started feeling some pain because once I start jogging, I'm going to feel um, belly pain. And I asked my coach, coach, do you think it's good that I take two more painkillers? Um, pain because I don't think the two that I took earlier was working. And he said, okay, yes, take the pain, um, two more painkillers. And so I was able to finish my workout, even though I was still fatigued during the workout, I was able to finish my workout. The times were there, it's not as fast as all, because normally I would definitely run two seconds faster or three seconds faster than the recommended time that coach gave to me. So I was able to finish my workout. As for fatigue, it is very important that I hydrate and I've tried liquid iron because iron pills doesn't always work for everyone and vice versa. So if you like pills, you can always take pills. If you don't like liquid iron, you can always, you know, so vice versa, take also sleep is very important for me. It, and so it's always important to make adjustments to your sleep schedule and to always ensure that you get enough rest and give your body enough time to recover. It. So, so like weight gain is, it's very popular when you're on your menstrual cycle. Cause for me, I, as small as I can be, I gain weight, I gain weight. And, and these are unnecessary weight gain. So you have to watch what you take, watch what you eat. As for weight gain, it's necessary that we maintain a closer look at our diet. So we'll begin to monitor your diet just a bit more as well as rehydration. Hydration and diet maintenance are important to monitor weight gain. So I always get support from my coach. He always, whenever I'm, I'm on my menstrual, um, I always tell him because female athletes, it's very important to let your coach know that you are going to your menstrual because they might think that, okay, you're just being lazy. You just want to come out there and just don't want to do your workout. But it's really important that you communicate with your coach. And I did communicate with my coach every time. And it really helps me. You really adjust my, 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 my schedule. You really adjust my, my workouts and it really helps. So always remember females, there is nothing wrong with you because we tend to feel that something is wrong with us and we should always have a support system that will help us. So it is really important. So just continue to do the proper thing to help yourself. And it's really an honor to be on this forum today to, ex to tell you my story. And I have plenty more stories, but I don't have enough time. So thank you for having me on this panel to tell my story today. And I hope that I could help someone out there to, to help them with their iron intake, with you know being iron deficiency before. I really hope I was able to help out. Thank you. 
If you're just joining us, we just heard from Olympian Natalia Gould, who spoke about her personal experiences with the obstacles that having her menstrual cycle has presented and how she's been able to overcome. I hope that everyone took note of the solutions that she shared because one of those solutions may be able to help you. Please be reminded that we will be taking questions after our second, second panelist presents. So tweet your questions to the Face JA, or you can post them in the YouTube chat. Also, please remember that we'll begin our second session at 5 p.m. where we'll have three presenters. Up next is Dr. Gillian Lawrence. She has been a member of the Jamaica Football Federation's medical team since 2016, and she's a team doctor to the senior reggae girls, as well as the under 22 reggae boys and the under 17 and under 20 reggae girls. She has also represented Jamaica in squash and football. She's the owner of Imagine More Sports Med, which is dedicated to the complete process of athlete, athlete diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation, and recovery. Dr. Lawrence, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to say thanks to everyone for actually logging on and uh, being a part of this. Thanks to Drive Phase Podcast for allowing me to be here, and it's more than a pleasure. Nice to hear uh, Natalia's story because she talks about real time. screen and just project uh, my presentation and we can talk some more from there. All right, so we're going to talk today about female body and athletic performance. Now, I want to start off with basically just two quotations. My girl, my quote said that I to him if he could run a little faster than he could. This is from Mia Hamm, an American footballer, Olympic gold medalist, and FIFA's Women World Cup champion. About self-esteem, learning how to compete, how to work hard, and how to achieve what you need to achieve. Jackie Joyner Kersey, member of the International um, Sport Olympic Gold Picture kind of stand. I put this up. Uh, this so very well. A few anatomical and physiological differences of the female athletes, the effect on their athletic performance, and talk briefly. Um, get some case information going on. Several myths pertaining to women and equal participation in sports, and this goes back to as early as the 20th century where girls' baseball teams were only allowed to play because the men couldn't play. Um, Olympic marathoners were men at the start in 1896 because they thought that women couldn't actually, didn't actually have that endurance able to come. So in 1980, which is a whole 80 years later, was the first time that women were actually allowed to compete in the Summer Olympic Games. We see differences in sex characteristics, both in prevalence and in incidents, anatomical and physiological difference, as well as sociological, environmental, and psychological influences. And we heard Natalia talk about her, her issues with uh, depression when certain things weren't you know, right and when she didn't feel right. And all of those things are things that, as she rightly pointed out, the coach and the management team need to be able to help you with. So just some information, in 2013, the CDC showed that 48.5% of high school girls played more than one sport, whereas it was 59.6% in boys. And by the age of 17, 100% of boys participated in more than one sport, whereas only 6% of girls did an average of about 30 minutes of exercise a day. So we talk about the sociocultural role, the role of parents, the role of more models, socioeconomic, um, stuff, sorry, status, as well as whether you know your siblings and your friends is something that your brothers and sisters or your friends do, and all of these. Is how, how their bodies start. Or 
geared towards what society deems as being more feminine because there's a lot more of a there's a lot larger psychological effect on the spotlight run. I think we had some technical, I think we might have had some technical difficulties there, um, but hopefully I'm back. And I'll just uh, pop, up where, pop up where we left off. We're talking about just sensitivities. Uh, the female um, wearing more clothing than she thinks. And, uh, you know, she likes the image that her body is actually portraying. Uh, conditioning programs that coaches put together need to be more specific for me for females because they have to be um, you know set towards them actually being able to do that we know that there are more males involved in sport altogether so what we really need to do is make sure that these male coaches trainers everyone involved with the female and the female athlete is aware of exactly what is going on so there can be more optimal performance now the female body as we can see there are differences anatomically between the male and the female. The female is shorter, a longer torso, a wider pelvis, things that we talk about like acute angle, probably a lot of things that I'll throw at you that might make a lot of sense, but hopefully I'll get a chance to just give you a brief explanation. Uh, musculature, the female has only 30 to 38 in terms of mus musculature and the fibers are actually smaller. The physiological differences, Natalia once again talked a lot about that in terms of blood loss for the female during her menstrual cycle. And in general, blood volume in females is actually lower. Our red blood cells are lower. Our hemoglobin level is lower. So a lot of these things at the start put us a step behind if you're actually going to try and compare us to the male and compare what we are capable of doing. Um, the heart is smaller. Thorax is smaller. with lower muscle mass. You know, and we can get in so much more detail. Talk also about the female athlete triad. Um, the healthy athlete who has a good balance of energy intake and expenditure versus the unhealthy athlete. They're so they're not like pain while competing, etc. Adolescent females tend to um, you know, have their go through a period where, you know, their bone is being laid down, but their linear growth has already stopped. So what you tend to find is that there are a lot more fractures in female adolescents through their time of maturation. Um, they start menarche like one to two years after puberty growth, growth and uh, breast budding. What, what we tend to find from the literature is that high performance athletes um, approach menarche or have menarche at a later age. This is either due to intense physical training prior to menarche or training that has started afterwards. But one of the things that we see with that is that with late menarche, there is a decrease in bone mineral accretion, which tends to lead to increased st stress factors. One good thing about that is there's still a lot of literature outstanding on that and still a lot of research outstanding. The female say, when we talk about estrogen, progesterone, effect, cardiovascular, heart, or metabolism, our lungs, you know, all the different functionality into their athletic performance. So changes of the heart, we have things like increased thrombo, so increased blood. People who know tennis and follow tennis will know now Williams and know her history of blood clots that have pulled her from major championships. It has also actually got worse since the birth of her child because pregnancy um, increases risk in females. You know, from a metabolic perspective, we have an increase of glycogen storage. Endurance runners that are female actually have an advantage because we can utilize a lot of these factors, increase lipid synthesis um, to our advantage. Um, 
Estrogen, as I said, it also works with bone metabolism. It gives us more of what we call uh, increased joint laxity, and that is utilized for childbearing years primarily. Um, but what it does is that in reference to injuries causes they have more injuries. Gesturone tends to just raise the internal body. Our increases our ability to ventilate and it increases our ability to respond when we're in a situation that don't. Nutrition and high protein requirements as females, um, some of that is due to the lower leucine oxidation rate of the female. And as such, the nutrition and hydration levels of females also have to be looked at differently. So when teens you know, or personnel that travel with individual athletes are traveling or are training, what we need to make sure we look at is that we look at upper for the female female athlete. Um, measurements of athletic performance, for the most part, it's usually done through physical fitness. That's what everybody knows, aerobic, anaerobic fitness, muscle strength, flexibility, et cetera. And those things are actually measured. Now in the female, we have one of those things that affect that greatly in terms of performance being the female athlete triad, which is a spectrum of three components, no energy availability, menstrual dysfunction, and low bone mineral density. Now we heard Natalia again talk about that and how those things affected her. And we're going to a bit of detail, just kind of showing, and the green triangle that you can see is the healthy athlete, the one that's not on their period or doesn't have any dysfunction, with their menstrual cycle, so everything is fine. They have a new menorrhea, they have optimal bone health, and they have good energy availability. Now, as your period comes on and you're in that premenstrual phase and closer to that time, then you have lower energy availability. There is, you know, as you continue to not eat well and go through those different phases, then you move from that green triangle to that red triangle, and then you start having issues and you become the unhealthy athlete. We talk about consequences, fatigue, decreased recovery time, decreased training response, impaired performance. Natalia told us about her 55 second time that she was wondering, you know, she hasn't done since high school. Impaired performance, nutrition deficits. So all of these things are actually, um, you know, very real for the female athlete. Um, body image also, psychologically, you know, how we look is important and there is improved performance. Uh, there is a desire from the female to look a certain way. And a lot of that can lead to eating disorders. It can, eat, it can lead to issues um, outside of that, psychologically as well, in terms of depression, everything. The team that surrounds this athlete needs to be aware of all of that. Concussions have been actually reported in terms of injuries, uh, higher incidence in females, not known to be anatomically or hormonally related. But it is there, and there is an increased metabolic requirement for the female brain. So what that does is that, or what the impact that has is that the, the medical team working with the athlete has to be aware so that when they're going through concussion protocols, they have to be aware that the baseline of the neurocognitive function for a female is very different from that of a male. Um, anterior cruciate ligaments, um, tears, injuries two to nine times greater in females. And a lot of that is just depend just because of the different Q angles. The hip is at, uh, the hip is wider. Uh, the meniscal slopes are increased. All of which happen because of the anatomy and physiology of a female. Uh, FIFA has just actually reported that they are now finding gene expression of extracellular matrix around the ACL ligament. In females, in reference to hormones, estrogen, they're actually still doing research to try and put that all together, but that is now coming out of FIFA as something that they are finding as to one of the reasons why females might have more ACL injuries. But femoral syndrome injuries, uh, pain in the knees, reported to be two to three times more in the female. And also, once again, we talk about a wider pelvis, an increased hip virus, all to facilitate the female in childbearing, actually. Um, asthma is one of those things that so many of us, um, especially in our population, you know, I have so many of my athletes and so many others 
that I see that say, oh no, they're not asthmatic or they were asthmatic as a child. But we need to realize asthma is something that once you're diagnosed as being an asthmatic, you are an asthmatic and you will find that overall it's increased in severity, morbidity and mortality in females. So it's something that has to be uh, looked at in detail. Um, contraceptives have the capability of making mild to moderate disease asthma actually better um, in, the, in the female as well. Um, I wanted to talk briefly. I know Natalia is an 800 meter runner and a 400 meter runner sometimes is probably very aware of this, uh, but just as a controversial issue with a female athlete, IAAF um, defined Uh, I'm not sure what happened there, but um, basically, Castor um, was Castor was stated to actually caused her to. So, actually. Um, banned from, she appealed, but her appeal didn't go through. So she's actually been banned from that. Uh, in concluding, I just kind of want to say that, um, you know, it's, the female athlete is one that has to have a team around her that is very aware of the different anatomical and physiological differences of the female. Uh, they need to be aware of their menstrual cycle, you know, the levels the doctors need to be aware of the levels of iron there. Making them to have the most, um, enabling them to have much better performances. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure sharing with you. Sorry that I went a bit over time, I think. Back over to you.
actually does. And once again, as I said, the research is kind of on both on on both sides of it. But what you actually find is that the irregularity of it, uh, the irregularity of it, causes you to have that susceptibility. The the hormones, the estrogen and the progesterone, in terms of of increase in itself, increased risk of fractures, etc., toxicity in the bone. So yes, this is the bottom line. That yes, it does. tend to try and have whether it be by use of oral contraceptives, etc., to try and actually their cycle. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Back to you, Natoya. Do you, how big a part do you play, believe that nutrition plays in terms of your menstrual cycle and how you perform? I think nutrition is very important, especially what you put inside of your body. Because if you, as an athlete, just want to eat anything, because when I was younger, I used to eat whatever I want because hey, I'm slim, you know, I'm like, Ugh, nothing going wrong. But as I get older, I realize that nutrition is very important, no matter how small you look, because yes, your body might not be getting bigger, but your age is getting, you know, you're getting older. So I think it's very important that you, you watch what you put inside of your body, whether you're an athlete or not, because health is very important and it have a big impact on you know performances because back in 2018 which was i can say is my was my best year ever in track and field i changed my diet i started eating differently and i saw a big impact on on how i race and so i think that it is very very important that we watch what we eat you know even as i mentioned before like especially when you're on your your, your menstrual if you're hungry there are other solutions you can you know do to 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 put in your body you don't have to go and say oh i want a kfc because you 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 you, can you know kfc in jamaica is like the best you know so you're gonna be like oh my feet for kfc let me go buy some kfc cats oh my craving this my craving that get some fruits fruits give you the same feeling you know i i, I snack on grapes apples strawberries you know any fruit instead of going and buy the regular you know snacks that i used to buy in walmart so it is very important to know what you put in your body that will help you while you're on the track. Thank you, Natalia. Okay, one more question for you, Dr. Lawrence. What should be the dif difference in treating women versus girl athletes versus women athletes while focusing specifically on their periods? And because you have persons, uh you have persons that work more like within a high school arena as opposed to with, you know, an adult, an adult female athlete. And th the biggest part of it is having that trust. You know, when we do, um, you know, preschool or pre-athletic clearances for female athletes, you have to have that conversation with them about their cycle and you have to um, make them with you as the physician and as the medical team. And as a team, it's going to be with them throughout their school careers and let them understand. And educating them is a big part of it, but realizing also, you know, that there are 12, 13, 14 year old girls who are very aware of what they look like, what is happening to them, what boys are going to think. So there's a large, a different psychological effect with the younger female athlete as opposed to the older female athlete. You know, the, the young adult uh, dealing with their period has dealt with it for that. They're more experienced with it. And how you as the doctor approach it, you know, when you speak to them and you talk to them about doing certain blood tests and, and opting for a certain methodology of treatment, it's not uh, necessarily done the same way with the younger athlete. Thank you again, Dr. Lawrence. How, Natalia, this one is for you. How do you, as an athlete, balance your menstrual strike cycle and the issues that come with it uh, and some of the solutions that you find? How do you balance that with the substances that are, are either banned or prohibited by water? 
well, I ensure that, you know, I'm not taking nothing that is illegal. Whatever I take for it, I ensure that it is on the list that say it is, you know, that it is okay for me to take. And just to give an example of, you know, me being on my menstrual cycle and competing, actually, like, because we as athletes and we as women, we don't go about and showcase, oh, I'm on my period, so okay, yes, blah, blah, blah. No, we don't do that. And my season last year, for most of the time, I was on my menstrual cycle. And even in Doha, for the eats and the semifinals, I was on my menstrual cycle. But in order for me to, you know, perform well, and as I mentioned before, I use liquid iron. So I have to ensure that, you know, I travel with extra liquid iron. And if I, if I travel and my liquid iron is finished, I just have to use my painkillers. So like most of the time when I travel, I, I, I am not able to bring my liquid iron with me because, you know, I will probably put it in a little bottle and bring it, but I'm not able to use it all the time. So it's really, you know, what you really want, you know, if you really want to do this or not. So I ensure that before I leave here, I, I you know, take my liquid iron and I find a way to bring it if I can't. Like in Doha, I ensure that I bring it. But once it's finished, it's like, I just have to, be mentally strong because as I said before, it can come with mental, like ment is mind over matter. So I, I be like, I need to go there and run. After I'm done, I'll be on the floor, spread out, my stomach hurting real bad, but I'm just gonna go there and do what I have to do because you know fatigue will take over. But if you're in shape, you know, you can be able to still run and run at time that you want. But if you're not in shape, then that's where the problem comes. So I tend to use, as I said, liquid iron. And what I eat, I, I love spinach. I, I eat different foods um, that have iron in them. And uh, that's how I, I able to get through this. Thank you, Natalia. I know I said the final question earlier, Dr. Lawrence, but this is my last question for you. What are the best sources that stakeholders can access information that can help them to support our female athletes better? Wow, and there's a good question again also. There is just, there's so much information out there. I mean, one of the, um, coming out of the, uh, the sports medicine industry, I would say that, I would say that everything that we do from that realm. So, you know, the American Society of, uh, American College of Sports Medicine, um, you know, any of those, you know, British, the British sports medicine journal, any of those sports medicine journals and for the different, most of the sports usually have a medical arm connected to it. You know, FIFA has FIFA medical connected to it. Volleyball has their own medical arm. Track and field has, you know, a medical arm attached to it. And a lot of these places, you know, give us information, whether it's in regards to um, testing, drugs, uh, you know, what can't be used by the athlete, what they need, and those things. And as I'll agree with Natalia as well. I think we need a lot more of these types of forums um, in the schools around our athletes to make them just a lot more of aware and to give our coaches and trainers an idea of what needs to happen and what they need to put in place and where their education needs to be in order to assist and help the female athlete grow. That is very true, Dr. Lawrence. We at the Dry Phase Media, we're very, very, it's important for us to focus on this topic and issues that affect our athletes as we look to make sports a safer environment. Natalia, final question for you. What are your words of encouragement for female athletes who have been affected not just physically, but mentally by their periods and the symptoms that come with their periods? I would say that as I mentioned before, don't think that you are alone. There's other persons that are going through what you're going through. Just open up to them and always know that there is nothing wrong with you, as I said before, because we tend to feel like there's something wrong with us because even if we have like male persons around us, or you know, they will be like asking you, get a period while you act the way you act. 
you know so it's like just remember that you are not alone reach out to other females that you know that go through like i am always here to 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 open and talk about it because i i have been through it and i have bad periods i have um uh, and other ladies out there they are even worse than me so i would say just continue to know that you are special and we are special without without menstrual cycle i don't know like <laughs> what would it be what would this world be <laughs> so just always remember that you are special and that there's nothing definitely nothing wrong with you and that you believe it or not there's somebody out there men you have men that understand and they will have a listening here even though they don't experience it they they will have a listening here and they will understand what you're going through even though they're not experiencing it so just always know that you are not alone in this situation and that you can make it through no matter what and just always you know attend to your body ensure that you're putting the right things in your body because depression is serious and a lot of athletes they get depressed by this depressed by the situation so just know that it is real and that you can find help if you if you if you don't want to talk to somebody close to you you can find help other places just always remember that it is not easy and when persons don't understand they will just you know sit back and see what you and don't even know what you're going through in life because you don't project and like let everybody know what is going on so and for those that are you know out there looking in just always remember give a smile to somebody because you don't know what they're going through on that day especially women we go through a lot thank you Thank you, Natoya. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence and Natoya for sharing so much information on this important issue of female athletes and how it affects their performance. Natoya, your solutions and your words of encouragement can not only be used by female athletes, but by every woman and girl out there that is affected by their period. We are now at the end of our first session. As we shared earlier, media, communication, media and communication specialists Marsha Boyce will be moderating the second half of the forum. Stay tuned as we have three dynamic presenters who will be sharing their own perspectives on this important topic. Over to you, Marsha. Thank you very much, Rashika. I am Marsha Boyce. And if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like button and, of course, subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends and family. Now, in this second session of our forum on female athletes and the menstrual cycle, you'll be hearing from Risa Grant, Michael Vassell, and Trishana McGowan. Now, we continue with a regional flair here with Risa Grant. Risa is currently the project officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee with responsibility for athlete services and programs. She's also a national athlete, having represented TNT in indoor volleyball for 15 years and since 2017, She's also competed in beach volleyball at the Commonwealth Games, CAC Games, and Pan Am Games. So Risa joins us with lots of experience this evening, both as an athlete and as an administrator. She will be discussing the role of coaches and administration in safeguarding women. Risa, over to you. Thank you very much, Marsha. Um, let me first start by saying um, good afternoon to everyone. And that is a pleasure to be included in such an important discussion that some may even say it is somewhat taboo in particular cases. Um, as we may know, traditionally, sports have been always, well, has always been male dominated, not just with recreation or competition, but also in the administrative aspects of sport as well. And unless any one of these entities may have wives, sisters, daughters um, that are actually participating in sport, they somewhat, most times, have little to no empathy or sympathy or even patience to deal with women and their menstrual cycle. The stigma alone or the cultural taboos of, menstrual, of the menstruation, as, as it has, has it down as really unclean, which makes it so easy to not speak about. As you may know, most of us women and girls, especially in the early parts of our lives, may have extremely 
painful menstrual cycle as um, the Jamaican Olympian on the first panel would have outlined to you all. Let me just take you back down memory lane. As I remember while playing um, as a professional volleyball player in Poland, we had a top series of games in which I had to play through whilst having loads of pain. And having to play through that, um, given the language barrier and a full coach and staff being me of male um, dominance, of course, it was hard to even translate what was going on at that point in time. Also, sometimes um, we would have these uh, extremely long eight hour plus bus rides to other cities. Um, and even through that time, it was difficult because um, when we have these bus rides, there would only be one or two pit stops in between. And in between that time, um, you would have the opportunity to use the restroom and so forth. But um, you would have to sleep on the bus, which often makes it a bit uncomfortable to do so. Um, over the years, however, I've been I've learned how to, to deal with it, um, mostly on my own. <laughs> I didn't have the guidance or um, no one telling me, hey, you know, you can talk to me at, at any time. Um, what are you going through? I, I realize this. Um, I realize that you're not playing at your best or you're not performing at your best. And, and you know, what is going on? No, I didn't. I wasn't afforded that opportunity. <laughs> I also remember another time um, when one of my friends who's also a top level athlete in athletics made it to the finals in her race at the CAC Games in Barranquilla, Colombia. Um, and she was going through a really, really tough period at, on that day in particular. Fortunately, having um, Dr. Nyla Adams, who's a female sports psychologist as part of our contingent, she was able to assist her through that difficult um, period. And well, my friend later went on to medal at the games. And, and these particular things that we need to always note and make sure um, as administrators that, that female athletes in particular need that type of support mentally. Think about it, as a young girl growing up in, and participating in several sports, it was hard to even reach out to a coach especially to even talk about um, your, well, my menstrual cycle or to even say, you know, my tummy ache or weakness and vomiting was because of it. You know, I, I personally didn't want to be seen as not tough enough. You know, I, I, I wanted to always be on the team. So I didn't want it to be placed on the bench coming from a team sport and, and having the coach say, well, you know, she can't play through pain, so she's not mentally strong enough for the sport. No, I don't want to be seen as that. So I made a, um, a decision to, to, to play through that, you know. And this, most times, is usually a, a mental thing for a lot of young girls and women within sport. The mental distress going through all these things while still having to perform at your best can seriously affect your performance. Imagine having to be placed on a bird control by your medical practitioner at an early age because of a painful period or because you, you're, you're having um, your menstrual cycle twice a month while competing. Imagine that, you know. Um, additionally, uh, most parents tend to educate girls, young girls, um, about their menstrual cycle on the day that they, they start to have their menstrual cycle. And is, there is no discussion before having um, your menstrual cycle. So let's say um, a girl whose menstrual cycle starts at 11 or 12, prior to having her menstrual cycle, there was no discussion. And this usually takes place um, around the world, but most, mostly in particular in the Caribbean region. You know, most times it's not a thorough explanation. And let's face it, um, not everyone has the benefit of having both parents. Um, there are single mothers and fathers raising, raising their children, their daughters especially, as well as have to juggle work, etc. which sometimes a lot of things are missed during the explanation process of the menstrual cycle. 
as an administrator in, in participating in several coaching courses, this sometimes is not even a topic of discussion during the courses. Over the years, being at the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee, our president, um, he takes women's health and development seriously, especially when it comes to selecting um, a team or a, a support staff for particular games. We have even here at the Olympic Committee created a Futures Female Element that is aimed to supporting women and young girls. I remember also being the chef de mission for the Commonwealth Youth Games in 2017 and having, um, it was a, a huge contingent, um, several team sports, one of which being rugby. And we had to insist that because it's a full female team with male staff dominance, we had to insist that a female chaperone um, be uh, tagging along with the team to facilitate the, the girls um, on the team and to support them and help them with whatever issues that they may encounter, um, especially at that young and tender age. This morning also, I had the opportunity to do a short presentation at the Olympic Youth Camp within the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee on anti-doping. And a question surfaced um, on a young female athlete providing a sample during the, the doping control process while being on their period. Because of the stigma, um, most of the girls within the camp felt as though it was a disgusting thing to even think about doing, you know, um, to, or experience uh, passing urine while on your period in addition to taking over the, the counter medications to easy pain. You know, the, these things are somewhat, sometimes does not work in your favor, especially for anti-doping purposes. Some over-the-counter painkillers may have banned substances in it. Um, and then, you know, next thing you know, you're, because of lack of education in, in this particular aspect, you have a, 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 um, a positive drug test. You know, luckily, because of the knowledge um, that I was fortunate to have, that I have now, uh, I was able to share with them the importance of feeling comfortable to have open discussions with not only medical practitioners, but their parents, their coaches, managers, while paying attention to the WADA prohibited list, especially when taking any type of medication and over the counter, over the counter or not. So in conclusion, coaches and administrators play an important role in safeguarding the health and safety of young girls and women in sports because athletes depend and rely on you, the administrator, which is myself as well included, for direction, for full trust. Let us face the fact that most athletes put majority of their trust in their coaches, you know, um, their managers, at, for other administrators as well. I believe that we need more women at the head of the table at all levels, not only to deal with issues such as mental the menstrual cycle, but other issues related to making sport a safe space for women and girls to participate. I strongly believe by having more webinars such as this one, um, community outreach programs, especially at the grassroots level, or even an educational program that focuses on the menstrual cycle and other issues related to women and young girls in sport should be included at the certification level for coaches and administrators. Let us help change the societal tradition of the male dominance in sport. And again, this is not to, to um, be negative to male coaches or coaching staff, but it's just to aid as a booster to support male coaches and administrators within this sport. Again, thank you so very much for having me. I hope I stayed within my 15 minutes. <laughs> and um, thank you very much, Mas Marsha, back to you. 
Oh, thank you very much, Riza. You're good for time, so don't worry about that. And remember, <laughs> you can put your questions in the YouTube chat section as our team is monitoring that space. We'll have the question and answer segment for this session immediately after the final speaker. Now, our next presenter is Michael Vassell. He's the head women's athletics coach at Excelsior High School in Jamaica. He's an IAAF, now World Athletics Level 5 certified coach, and has produced multiple high school and character champions, as well as national junior record holders in both the shot put and discus throws. He's the founder of Throws Are Us and three field event-based meets in Jamaica, the Big Shot, King of the Ring, and the Final Fling. Michael has served on the Jamaican coaching team to the Pan Am Games and the World Indoor Championships and has been the Carissa Games head coach. Now this evening, he takes us through striking the balance, approaches to preparing female athletes for competition. So I hope you coaches are ready to take some notes. Michael, over to you. Good. Um, I must say first, I am honored and humbled to be a part of this forum with so many people. And the fact, as the only male here, I think I am a little bit out of my depth. But one thing I can tell you, what has prepared me for this is the fact that I, as a, as a parent, as a father of three girls, it, um, I mean, well, one participated in sports, it kind of gave me an insight as to how to deal with the female athletes and what they go through. And I am not going to try and go through the science of the whole thing because Doc went through the science and Natalia spoke to some of the science of it. And everybody will speak about the mood swings and the weight loss and the body, the, 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 the body stuff that, that the girls go through at that time. Because at the end of the day, it is really, it is really a, a, a tricky time for these young females, especially. And I think um, for me, it is about understanding, especially how to how to get that trust. I think um, Dr. Um, Dr. Gillian spoke about the trust. You need to have the trust of the young athletes because for me to get a 12-year-old girl to speak about her menses, I mean, it is in, in of itself, it's a taboo subject. A lot of people don't like speaking about it. A lot of young girls don't know how to speak up, speak about that they're afraid, they don't know what's happening. And to tell the truth, a lot of male coaches tend to treat female athletes, as I like to say, boys with boobs, which is really the wrong way to go about it. I mean, there are so many different things. Um, girls are so different. They, they look at, they interpret things differently. So you might give one set of instructions to the boys and one set to the girls, but you'll find that the girls will give you two or three more questions. And it, I think it's really the nature and the fact that they want to do so well in this male dominated arena that they, they, they try to get less things wrong. And I mean, to tell the truth, sometimes it, it makes it that much easier to deal with them because they try that much harder, at least for me, in my, in, in my estimation. But in terms of this whole balancing act of what to do, when to do, um, a lot of, as I, as again, the whole taboo subject. A lot of coaches tend to totally ignore it. Um, you try and tell the girls that they are to toughen up. I mean, yeah, you're just feeling a little pain. No, I do not know the level of pain that they go through, but I can only imagine what it's like, and I can imagine how severe it is. So I would not, I, I, for me, my, 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 my takeaway on that is that, listen, if we get, we're in the middle of a competition, you are having your menses, we say, okay, what is your pain level like? Um, from a one to 10, let me know. And we go through that, we go through a little question and answer stuff. I say, okay, do you feel that you can continue? It's a yes and no. I can do X, I can do Y. And one thing that I try to do is say, listen, do not be disappointed now because of what is going to happen because you are there and you are pushing yourself to say, okay, I want to do well, but you're unable to do well. And then you as a coach will have to deal with that fallout if the athlete goes ahead and they compete 
And at the end of the competition, they come out and they're like, oh, geez, they did so bad and this and that. And they're, they're killing themselves. Say, listen, you have to remember what happened a while ago. You have to remember what is happening to you. The changes that are going through your body right now. So you now have to understand that, listen, we'll take this. The mere fact that you are able to compete is a victory in and of itself. Because, And then, then we find ways and means to work around this. Let's say, okay, how do we treat this? How do we prepare you for this? Because it happens at the most important time in your life. Um, what do you do? You're at the championships. What do you do? How do you treat it? So we go through a lot of these scenarios. And sometimes it's good when in the Jamaican system, we have like four or five, six meets that we go to. So the situation might arise. So we, we, we tend to go through this maybe two or three times for the season. And it's it's a process. It's actually a process. And as I think Riza spoke to it, it's that it's about being able to talk them through through it. I mean, because there are, I know when dealing with girls, there are some of them who they'll come to me and they'll say, Sir, um, it's the first day. You know, we have been to that level where they understand. I said, day one, I said, okay, all right, cool. I said, I understand. Day one means that you will be my assistant for today because you can do absolutely nothing. I would not ask you to do anything because cramps are too much. The flow is great. I mean, and usually this is this is usual for my older girls, girls 16, 17. That discussion is a little bit more than the younger ones. And and again, it just comes to that being that father figure that they can actually come to and speak about these things. And not a lot of men are comfortable speaking about these because of the whole taboo with the subject. So I mean, it's presenting yourself as that person. That is, that is able to speak to it. Now, in terms of preparation, um, I sent up a PDF chart, which is really, which is, which is which is one of the only things I want to, to look at. It's just kind of an idea of the psychological and physiological changes that, that the body goes through during that cycle that can help coaches who are not really used to it, like an idea what to do at that time. It, it really speaks to the changes that are happening in the body and the load that you can apply as a coach. What can you ask the athlete, the young female athlete to do at that point in time? So um, if, I know I sent it, if I could get that PDF up on the screen then we could at least talk to it and have a look at it. Where is my PDF? Right. So it, 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 that PDF would actually help us to, to be able to understand a little bit more of the changes happening in the body at the time and what to do to, as a, as a coach, what to do, how, 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 what load can you apply at that point in time. Okay, well, we have, okay, we have it up. Yes, Michael, it's up on the screen, so you can. Right. Now, um, you see, I, again, I, it's just this whole science thing. I don't want to get too much in a sense. But what this does, this shows you the different stages, the different days, and what is happening in the body at that time, the effect on training. So we know, like, the first, like the first five days, um, mood, the mood changes, poor reaction times, um, perception of exercise and that, okay, it means that, okay, at this point in time, they really and sure don't feel like doing a lot because the energy level is low. So um, as coaches know, you have to understand that you now need to tailor your workload to try and and fit the mood, the mood and the, 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 the level that they're at. So this is, this is something that, that most coaches can use as a guide. I mean, for for me, we were working with, with, with the young ladies. I know that they usually have like maybe four or five of them happening at the same time. So it, it helps that you can group them together. You can, you can put them to work. And one of the things is that it, it, it's really about knowing when you can put in like, like your strength and power training because you can actually get some good gains because of the high level of testosterone that is actually um, 
and kind of actually prevalent in the in the female system at that time. So I mean, like during that like 10 to 14 days during that time, the testosterone level is high. So you actually can get some good work and you can heavy intensity or medium intensity. You can do some good strength work. You can get some gym work in. And actually, I mean, just looking back at the science, it has shown that you are able to get a lot of strength gains during that time. But as coaches, you have to understand you have to understand that okay you are able to apply that kind of load so you know um it's, it's one thing that a lot of coaches might never have looked at um they tend i think most male coaches in this in the system might just look and say okay you know what uh you're having cramps take a break um do some light work today but if you are smart and you understand the people you're working with you are actually able to get some good work in at the time if you try if you understand the cycles and you're tracking the cycles and you have that discussion with the athlete because that also is key okay i hope everybody can understand this what is happening here right and i think i really i really i mean for me it would really be about question and answers about people asking what to do how to do it and what what are my strategies to deal with the young ladies at that point in time so i think that's really me for this presentation back to you marcia thank you very much michael now our next presenter is one who well, I prefer to put the spotlight on the media. Um, Trishana McGowan is a former athlete and now a well-known sports journalist. The former hurdler is a Carista and CSE Games medalist, having also competed at the World Junior Championships. She entered the media profession first as an analyst for the London 2012 Olympic Games for KLAS Radio. And since then, she's worked with Sportsmax, CVM, Flow Sports, and most recently, the RJR Gleaner Group as a reporter, producer, and analyst there. She also co-hosted the Girls Sports Club, the first ever all-female radio talk show in Jamaica. Now her presentation will focus on the role of the media, why we need to talk about periods in sport. Let's welcome Trishana McGowan. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're joining from. And I'm happy to be a part of this discussion. And, uh, you know, the role of the media, but before I even go there, I think it's a discussion first. The media can do so much and no more. And that's with the menstrual health and all other issues that we have in sports. So the role of the media really is at the second tier because we first need athletes to be speaking about it. And when I first did this story, I did a report on this back in 2019, just before our Isha Boys and Girls Championship. And when I focused on the topic, I asked a few coaches if I could speak to some of their senior girls about it. When the coaches went to some of the girls, they were not comfortable to come on camera and speak about the topic, but they were quick to, you know, tell me things behind the, the, the scene. So that, that's one of the things that we'll have, you know, in terms of the athletes having to talk about it before we can really look to segue into it totally and get the information carried how we would want to. Also, some of the senior athletes, what you found was recently for this, because we have the webinar coming up, I decided that I wanted to really get some reactions from senior athletes. Only a few were willing to talk about it uh, on video or on camera. And, you know, a lot of the ladies, senior women, they too were standoffish about the whole situation because of what is perceived. I, when I did the, 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 the story, like I said last year, I started it by saying it's a taboo subject and it remains a taboo subject until women in sports start being comfortable about speaking about it. So I think that's where the media, uh, you know, rests right now where that is concerned because you can carry things as, as scenarios over and over and over 
But then when you want to delve deep into some of the issues, you don't really, you might not have the women coming forward and, and being very open about it. You know, so that's one of the, the, the concerns we'll have. So what I did though for this, before I go any further, uh, like I said, people not wanting to be on video, so I had to get some responses by WhatsApp messages. I asked a few coaches, you know, to ask in their group how girls really feel during that moment, and some of the senior athletes also reacted. So I have that video I'm going to play, and then we can talk some more about it. When you look at some of the reactions and, and stuff from these ladies, senior and junior athletes, you know, from the video being played, we're going to really talk about that, you know, because you see um, even some of the comments that I'm not sure fully, where women are saying, you know, they're uncomfortable. And I think that whenever we're having events, even the Olympic Games, whatever it is, and our boys and girls championship, Caribbean islands having stuff. When you look at these, you know, just the the notice, the notes, the, the the sayings of the ladies in the video, I think it it calls for more attention. Uh, restroom at a lot of the meets in Jamaica. I cannot speak for outside of Jamaica, but a lot of the restrooms also are a concern. That can be something that media look to highlight, applying pressure to to organizers to have you know better. For, uh, toilet, toilet facilities for girls because you don't want us to just, you know, um, go in and and just, you know, it's not it's not really user friendly at that point in time. So based on that video that you just saw, thank you guys for, for playing that video for me. I hope you know persons saw some of the reactions from from senior and junior athletes. Like I said, that is a concern uh, for, for for a lot of the ladies. Yes, yeah, so I'm hoping that, you know, the ladies and the, the girls will start being comfortable, somewhat, you know, expressing better to their coaches, to managers of teams, 
and so that coaches can know what to do. And I think that's one of the problems. We, we are surrounded by male coaches in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. So you find that they can't know everything. So the onus now becomes on, on the girls and the women educating themselves first so they can educate their coaches and managers so that we can have a better uh, understanding all around as to what we're dealing with. Knowledge is power, I've always said that, especially where the, the menstrual cycle is concerned. You don't want it to be a case where athletes are showing up to a meet and, you know, really not feeling well because of that. And you maybe have other meets to come and you can maybe pull that girl from that meet or that, or that woman can be pulled from a particular meet and compete some other time. You know, so, so many things, like I said, you know, the women and girls can start doing, you know, being comfortable, talking about it. And that's a first step. I think that that will be massive for women in sports, talking about menstrual cycle. And you don't have to talk publicly on social media, but you can educate yourself, educate your friends, educate your coaches and managers and those around you so they know how to handle the situation. And then now it starts becoming a thing where media and everyone can get involved. So that's my, that's my take on it, Marshall. Back to you. Thank you so very much, Trishana, for that presentation there on the role of the media. And of course, I'm also very keen on this area as a media practitioner myself. Now, guys, let's jump right into our question and answer segment. And Riza, I think I'm going to start with you this time around as you wear that hat of both, you know, um, athlete and administrator. Now, as you mentioned, this topic is still a very taboo issue. So specifically as an administrator, and we're looking at the Caribbean environment where we tend to keep a lot of things private, you know, there are a lot of myths surrounding menstruation and sport. What do you think sporting organizations can put in place to help female athletes to not only understand this process better, but also to be able to get the best performance during um, the entirety of their menstrual cycle? Thank you. That's a really good question. I think as administrators, we need to first realize that, um, especially when carrying a team abroad, um, that the team consists of lots, well, majority of the time it's male dominated, right? So we need to also take into consideration that there are female athletes included in the contingent and that um, support is a major aspect for female athletes during their competition time. So I believe that having um, change this or balance the support of staff with respect to a medical practitioner, um, a physiotherapist, uh, or even a chaperone that can help um, to support women uh, um, with their progression to um, performing their best within sport. Um, Separate from sport, I believe that um, we too could create maybe a, a safe space in terms of a mentorship program that deals with not just the menstrual cycle, but particular issues related to um, other, um, other issues that women and young girls may encounter during um, um, part, pra participating in sport. Now, um, remember, I, most girls at that tender age are shy to speak about it. So if you create a, a space or avenue where they can feel comfortable enough to share, to speak, where we can um, help edu further educate them um, by supporting them on uh, and educating them on what they may encounter at the more advanced level, that would trickle back down into the grassroots level. They may tell their peers, they may, you know, be feel a little bit more comfortable to discuss um, their menstrual cycle across the board. Thank you very much, Riza. Now, Michael, a question for you. In this um, technological age, you know, we have an app for almost everything now. And increasingly, we're seeing period monitoring apps not only being used by the everyday female, but there are some being created specifically for female athletes to help them track their, men their menstrual cycle and be able to monitor you know, what phase they're in, et cetera. As a coach, have you ever used these types of platforms or do you think you know, this is something we can employ 
going forward for coaches and athletes to get on these apps so that, you know, someone might not necessarily feel comfortable speaking in a training environment, but there might be direct messaging within the app or you have that full monitoring um, right throughout your cycle. What is your take on that? Well, actually, I think that's pretty good. I know of a few of the, you know, those fit bands that they have, they have this um, menstrual cycle tracking app. And I think it, I think it actually would be a good way for coaches not to, who don't want to get directly involved. I think sometimes it's a cost that really hampers a lot of people that, but I really think that that would be a good way. And now that you say it, I am actually going to try to implement that with a couple of my female athletes, which should help us to be able to, and me as a coach, to be in a better position than having to try and remember how, you know, how and when and all that. So, yeah, I think, I actually think that would be a pretty good idea because it would help and it would provide vital information to coach and other support staff. Thanks, Michael. Now, Trishana, I'm going to come to you in a moment, but Dr. Lawrence, um, I was wondering if you had any familiarity with these apps and using them in a team or training environment. Yeah, hi. Actually, I think that's uh, a very good question that you put to coach. And uh, there are several apps out there. A lot of what's happening now, as you said, in our technological age, uh, we have monitoring programs. So you see a lot of athletes wearing uh, these bras that monitor everything, their heart rate, um, you know, they monitor everything. And a part of those apps, when all of that information is dumped in, a part of those apps actually have you um, track the menstrual cycle for each athlete as well. So what you do is like from a medical perspective, when we have um, initial data in terms of hemoglobin levels and iron levels, et cetera, it gives you the ability to see when the athletes are in their lull phase and when you know they're not producing as much hemoglobin or depending on where they are in their phase and you can track them one against the other so like with our you know with our female national team we don't use that particular app but we use something very similar where every day um they send in you know they report in with questionnaires in terms of where they are in their cycle you know, and they have about 10 questions that they answer every morning in reference to sleep, menstrual cycle, how they're feeding, etc. So we know, you know, and we take that data and we put it, you know, in a very large spreadsheet and we go through that and monitor it. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's very essential. And I think anybody that's dealing with uh, female athletes has to have this sort of stuff implemented because it is, it is crucial to know, it is, it is integral to know. So I'm very glad to hear that Coach Vassal will think about integrating something like that with his athletes. Because whether it's a singular sport, a, you know, track and field, or it's a, it's a team sport, you know, it's the female athlete is important and that those sort of things have to be tracked. So good question. Thank you very much, Dr. Lawrence. Now, Trishana, a question for you, because as you mentioned, it was very difficult um, getting some of the female athletes to speak openly about their periods and what goes mm -hmm. along with it. So to your mind, what do you think we can do to make female athletes more comfortable about talking about their menstrual cycle and their periods and what they experience? Thank you for that question. So again, there's I have I have a PDF uh, file that I want to you know just bring that up a bit, so I can you know just run again through some of the things that were said by some of the ladies, and then we we, we just quickly you know answer that question. So on the PDF, you're going to see where ladies are saying how they feel weak, and you know some of the symptoms that they do experience. Now, when an athlete is going to say they feel weak or they're feeling nauseous and, you know, they, 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 sometimes even they don't want to talk about it. You know, so many things. The barrier starts in school. It starts at home. We have to enforce, we have to encourage that people are talking about the menstrual cycle slash or period, whichever one they, they want to talk, whichever one they want to call it. We are too afraid as women to talk about our period. This is not our fault. It's a part of us. So we cannot expect athletes, it's the same thing for all women, just that we're focusing on athletes. Too often as women, we, we, we are feeling you know, shy about the topic of our period. 
it is, it is, it is what, you know, it's like I said, it's just really a situation where we have to start educating ourselves as women and our girls. We have to enforce and, you know, whether it be from the media's perspective by asking, is this something being discussed in school? How much focus is, is put on that? You know, we have to encourage our women to read more. Um, girls, like I said, women and girls to read more about the subject. And like I said, as media, just the same, we always be, we, we do things about, you know, school and so many other things. Uh, we can take it from that perspective in terms of saying, is this something being discussed in school? How much of it is being discussed also at home? We cannot expect her to show up uh, in sports and be comfortable with it if it's not being discussed in those personal spaces at training where she's comfortable with a coach slash manager or at home with her parents. So I think that's some of the concerns um, that I have about the shyness about that people have about discussing the period. We have to break that cycle. When that cycle is broken, then it will translate over into sports. Whenever we do interviews, we'll find that, that women are willing to talk about it. Because uh, I think Tiana Bartoletta of the United States, long jump uh, Olympic champion, world champion, she spoke about that, you know, how her body attacked her. And when she found out, did some checks, it was fibroids. We have athletes, senior athletes out there with fibroids. Will they talk about it? No. You may be about it sometime after they retire. So the taboo really is, you know, with, with women worldwide, but the culture of Jamaicans and the culture also of, of the Caribbean, we, 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 are, we come across embarrassed about some things that we really have no control over. And that cycle needs to be broken before we can start going forward. Thank you very much. Natalia, I'd like to bring you in here. During your presentation, you mentioned that, you know, female athletes should really be open and let their coach know when they're menstruating or when their menstrual cycle has started, etc. So my question to you is, what can coaches do to create that kind of environment where a female athlete would actually feel comfortable volunteering this kind of information? Well, my coach is easy to talk to. I don't know about other person's coach, but with my coach, it's not like, oh, I'm scared to talk to him about it. He's open to hear what I have to say. So if he sees me come to practice and I am feeling a certain way, I'm looking a certain way, he knows it might even, because for me, I start seeing like all the symptoms from a week before the actual menstrual cycle comes. So if, for instance, say I start feeling um, the, the symptoms today. I know that next week, Saturday is when my menstrual is going to come. It's like a whole week before. And so I will tell coach, coach, I'm feeling the symptoms now. It's not the time for my menstrual yet, but I always feel it the week before. And he really understands and, and, and he does not make it seem like it's a big old thing or, oh, you can go through it. He encourages me, even if he realized that I'm in pain, he will say, if I can't go, then don't go but I always tend to want to push forward and finish my workout even if I am hurting so with my coach he always always there and always encourages me and always you know is a listening here so I don't feel uh, uncomfortable at all telling him that yes coach I'm on my menstrual cycle I say he said coach today you know, I mean no oh, this all going you know, on today you no know, coach because today you know it come today so just tell you no know, coach say if you see me now finish my workout if you see me now do it then you know say it there and I'm like okay you know do what you have to do if you can manage it then such and such so he's very understanding and I hope that other coaches are understanding with their athletes too because not many athletes are like me that gonna be saying hey coach this and this you know this is happening so I really do hope all the coaches which a lot of Jamaican coaches of a majority of female athletes, I hope they understand also. Thank you, Natalia. Riza, I also want to get your take on that question because you are an athlete as well. I mean, playing beach volleyball is almost like, you know, it's a very vulnerable sport in terms of what you might be wearing, et cetera. What do you think coaches can do to help females, you know, feel comfortable discussing certain things in that environment? Really, really good question, Marsha. Um, well, being, a, being on a team sport, sometimes it's, it's a bit difficult because um, when I play indoor volleyball, uh, our coach, because of the language barrier, he was Cuban. Um, we weren't able to relate that type of information back then. You know, um, 
so it, it was a bit uncomfortable to talk about so we would talk about it amongst peers and um we had our manager our female manager um miss susan pay at that time she was like a mother to the team so anything we needed with respect to menstruation cycle or um whatever issues we were, we were dealing with um female issues more likely and we would go to her for any ounce of advice that um, she can give to us. But with respect to speaking directly to our coach, that to us was a no-no. <laughs> um, I've had since then um, a female coach and a male coach with respect to beach volleyball. And I believe that, um, like Natoya said, just having that trust and that level of comfort to talk to your coach um, is one of the most important thing for a female athlete. Um, you would never hear me telling this coach today is the day, like how Natoya is so free to talk about it. No, I am so reserved or have, have, have always been, but, um, like I would sit with my, my pair and I would explain to her, say, girl, you had to pull this one for the team today, you know, because today is a serious painful day for me you know and and we will talk about it amongst ourselves um with respect to uh, um the clothing the type of clothing we wear um i know swimmers and athletics notoria you probably wear the two-piece and i'm not sure how it's referred to in track right um there's always in the back of your mind the what if it slips out moment you know the and 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 let's face it media tend to capture every single thing on competition day so that there's always that nervous aspect as to yo okay don't panic too much though you know it's 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 safely secured you know it's it's so that that what if moment tends to put a lot of pressure on the mental aspect as well so when you're thinking about all the pain or the you know the stress of talking with your coach bringing all that information, giving him that information is always that what if moment. <laughs> Thank you, Riza. And Michael, coming back to you again, you work a lot in the junior environment with a lot of young females. Um, for a coach who might not have considered this before and is now looking to you know, incorporate this kind of knowledge and awareness into their respective programs, what kind of advice would you give to them? Well, um, the first thing the coach will have to be, they, they have to be open. They have to be open. They have to be willing to be vulnerable in a sense. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to discuss these seemingly taboo issues. You have to present yourself in a manner that you'll be approachable. Because, again, it's a really taboo subject. I mean, there are men who will not buy these things in the supermarket. They will not walk with them they don't do that so you you as a coach will have to understand that this as as he said it's it's a part of the cycle it's a part of what happens it's a part of it's a part of this athlete so you as a coach know you have to put yourself in that position so listen if i want everything from this athlete i have to this athlete will be able to trust me as much as i want to trust them so it's about building that trust it's about building that relationship and it might mean taking baby steps it might mean just having that small discussion. It might also mean having a discussion with the child and the parent. You have a discussion with the child and the parent, especially, especially at that age, where some parents might feel that you as a male should not be discussing this with their daughters. So you have that discussion with the parent. You have them to understand that, okay, there are going to be times when I'm going to need to know this information. So, you know, that whole handing over in a sense, and again, male coaches have to be willing to put themselves in that situation and, and really and truly a lot of them aren't comfortable with it. Masha, can I can I add to what he just said? Right. Um, so as an administrator at the Olympic Committee, um, I believe that we did a lot um, to support female athletes, especially leading up to the event so we had we've had workshops supporting not just female athletes but the the, the contingent in particularly 
to make them feel comfortable and get acquainted with um, the team. I think that is also important. So when they create a relationship with person, some other sport, then you could relate, um, be relatable to what you may be going through. And somebody else on the team may also be going through that same thing. You know, so you develop that sort of relationship and you have an additional support athlete to athlete here at the Olympic Committee. So we try to do that um, before the actual competition and during um, our pre-games camp um, within the Olympic cycle. So just to add to what um, Coach uh, Vassell was saying, I think that's extremely important that, that, that other countries or um, persons who are preparing for competition can you know, look into. So Dr. Lawrence, I wanted to bring you back in here. Um, thinking about periodization and working in a team sports environment where, okay, you might have a very set schedule in terms of training, particularly in the buildup to a specific tournament, you might want everyone on the same program, but yet you have 11 up to 18, sometimes 22 females who might all have different cycles, you know, <laughs> clashing at different times. How do you manage that kind of environment? Uh, good question again. I think, fortunately for us, especially at a senior team level um, in the football arena, we, we have gotten a lot better at it. We've gotten a lot better at it because the management team that surrounds these group of people has been pretty stable over the last three years. Um, and by doing so, there is that trust that Coach Vassal talked about and that, you know, Riza talked about. There is that trust between those athletes and all of their staff. You know, they have a female doctor. They have a female uh, physical therapist. You know, they have male coaches, you know, but they're, so they have a female manager. But there is such integration amongst that management team, you know, that they're all very comfortable. And once again, because we collect that type of data from them and they are not, shy at all in sharing that data because we collect that data from them on a daily basis so if we're going into competition and we try to go into a one week or two week camp prior to um us, us us going for competition all of that information we're gathering at that time before they come into camp for the players that are overseas our international players you know we start polling them from before we go into camp what's going on so we have an idea of where everyone is so that we kind of know what we're going into. And I think that is the biggest thing is to have an idea. So in going forward, you know, you have to try and find a way to figure out and get that data, get that information and that trust from your athletes within the entire group for them to say to you, you know, this is where we are so that you can then know how to manage it in terms of training sessions, in terms of medical input, you know, who, you know, takes what baralgin works better in terms of pain control for this one, whereas Advil works better for this one. You know, you need to know what is, you know, what is banned versus what is not banned. You know, who can take an injection, who can't, who has bad periods, who has low hemoglobin and all of those things. You know, and the only way you get that information and the only way you manage that is if you collect that data. And that is why that is so integral now. And that is why, you know, data collection is such a big push now, you know, in athletics, uh, you know, worldwide. And we are probably in the Caribbean a little behind in doing a lot of that. But I think that's where we need to get to, where we can get all of that information. Because, you know, in all honesty, you know, and all of the athletes here, you know, Riza is a past athlete and Natalia can tell you, it is something that can be managed. And not only symptomatically in terms of pain, you know, but you manage them psychologically as well. You know, and that is a big part of it, and their peers help with that. So it's an entire, it's, it's a focus that everybody needs to be involved in, and everybody needs to be on the same page. And I think the, the bottom line is that it's about what data you collect and the trust that you have and the trust, you know, that these players and that these athletes have in you as a staff.
Thank you very much, Dr. Lawrence. And it's very heartening to see that we are doing that kind of data collection here in the Caribbean, because as you mentioned, it's an area where, as it relates to analytics where we tend to be very behind. And hopefully, you know, we can move to the stage where we are publishing um, the research from this data collection that then could inform other teams and so forth through, throughout the region. And Trishana, we have your PDF up for you now, so I know you wanted to touch on that. And then there's another question I have for you as well about the role of social media in all of this. <laughs> Yes. So when you look at, uh, thank you so much again, Marshall. When you look at, you know, some of the comments, so we can start with one in particular. Mine came at Gibson Relays this year and flopped me out. So that is a concern. Like I said, you know, the role of the media is, is, is minimal in this situation. We're, not because it's sports and we're covering sports. It, it is minimal, but yet so critical. Because just the same, like I said at the start, whenever, as analysts, commentators, we can throw out the possibility of an injury for, for a boy or a girl, we don't know if they're injured or not, but we're quick to say, oh, maybe they're injured. I want our commentators, I want, I want our analysts to be comfortable. Same like how we can take jobs at injuries that we don't know if it's injury. And then sometimes you find out say, they maybe just had a cramp. I want, to, I want to start hearing, you know, some of our commentators and our analysts, including myself. I'm not saying you just don't go off the tangent and start saying that. But it can be something that, you know, we, we can look at and, and say just maybe, you know, she, she, she is having uh, some menstrual. Yes, we can comfort. We, we should be comfort, comfort, comfortably saying that maybe it is our menstrual cycle. Just maybe. We're not saying it is. We're not saying the youth is injured. We're not saying the girl is injured. We're not saying it is our menstrual cycle. We're saying it could be. So it's the same thing. I want us to start allowing these athletes to say it and realize that as humans talking about the sport and those that are watching and we're commentating, we're talking about it, we're all comfortable talking about it. It's a collective effort. It's not a one-person job. And, you know, we, we, we spoke about it, Natalia Gu spoke about it, the culture of, of, of the Americans and the Europeans versus the Jamaicans and the rest of the Caribbean. We, we come across shy about the issue. We're in 2020, we see movements and changes happening. We have to start going with, with the time. We have to talk about these things and let our ladies know it is normal. Let our girls, that is the thing, our girls, that's where it's starting from. It's not just women being embarrassed at 20, 25, 30. It's starting from a younger age and education is important. Another comment that struck out to me was about, I think Dr. Lawrence also spoke about that, uh, you know, during the doping, Coach Vassal, you know, would have, would have known about a lot of these things. When ladies go to the restroom, maybe during a doping situation and just overall competing sometimes in the Caribbean. Again, that person spoke about, you know, it can be uncomfortable for them. As the media, as, as people hosting these events, we can, we can say to them, you know, let us start seeing what you have in place for women, um, for, for the girls at these trap meets. The portables are, are, are good, but we need to start, you know, maybe putting aside, you know, two um, and, let, and, and, and keeping them very clean, having things in place. A lot of things are not in place. When you go to these meets as a my athletes, I can tell you, we need to, 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 as media, put pressure on organizers to say, can you not get a sanitary uh, company to sponsor these events so that if a girl is to show up, not all girls are coming from the same household. Thanks for sharing that, uh, for, for, for that graph, you know. Um, not all girls are coming from the same environment in Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean. So some households, some schools just might not have, you know, a kit walking around with, with sanitary napkins. However, if we have a station there with maybe a sponsor, you know, catering to the day, you know, identifying a girl so that no one girl or two girl is coming every time for, for a sanitary napkin, but they can get these. We need to be looking out for the women because it's, a, it's, 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 it's not a necessity, you know, and I think people, that's something people need to remember. It's not, a, it's not a necessity. At some point in time, until you go through menopause, we have to deal with it. We're going to have it and we have to, to encourage and do the necessary things collectively so that all can feel comfortable.
And staying with you, Trishon, I just wanted to touch on the social media aspect of it. Because we see in this day and age, you know, a lot more conversations are happening in that social media environment. We're talking about, about a lot more things more openly than we used to before. To your mind then, is the social media space a space where we can encourage awareness and, you know, knowledge about these issues? So it no longer is an issue and it is now, you know, just another part of the process. I think it will be an issue. <laughs> Uh, for maybe another 10 years or thereabout because it's hard to break the, the, the mindset of that of a woman of at the age 40 or 50 or a woman maybe at 25. So it will be around for a while because that's where we really have to, we have to fine tune that because you, you still find women, especially when I did the post and you found women coming into my DM um, in, in my inbox you had persons messaging like, how are you so comfortable talking about it? For me, first of all, I want to know who else out there is suffering. Please to share how you're suffering. Tell me what you're taking when you're suffering. I want to know because what if I am taking Advil gel or something and it's not working? I want you to tell me that, oh, you can maybe try fetamol or something. I don't know. Like I said, we need to start remembering that, you know, we are in a time of movement. Things can be done. So social media is a big platform. And I think that we supporting each other. Women are so divided. But I think for things like this, we have to find ways to come together so that this movement can start going places. And like I said, the movement is not for every woman or every girl. We don't expect that. Of them to come out and say oh i'm on my period this month i'm on my period this week i'm on my period today no we are wanting we i want information to be shared on social media as to say okay you know if you're having this symptom or whatever we are not gynecologists we're not doctor i don't follow i'm not trying to take your job or anything but i'm just saying we can educate each other and if you're seeing something similar you may be then onto something you then maybe feel more comfortable going to the doctor you maybe feel comfortable saying, oh, maybe this is what has been happening to me all this time. Because black people, black men and women, we're not going to talk about the men, hi, Mr. Vassal, not throwing any jobs at you. But we don't like going to the doctor. The fear of knowing keeps us from going to the doctor. But I think that, you know, so what you find is social media has become a big outlet where people run to to find things. People run to Google doctor before them go actual doctor. So that's alone tell you. The, the time that we're in. So the information is there so that a girl that may be in a household where she cannot get information and she's shy to ask that information public or, or whatever, maybe on social media she can see that if her cycle is going for more than 14 days, something might be wrong, she might be having irregular period or whatever. So education uh, nowadays, especially on social media, that's a massive move. You cannot go wrong. So I think that's, a, a, that's an avenue in which we can start looking to head to. Uh, a lot more and being open about things. Thank you very much, Trishana. Just two more questions, one for you, Natoya, and one for Coach Vassal. Um, Natoya, firstly, just touching on something that both um, Riza and Trishana mentioned, that doping control process as a professional athlete. From a personal perspective, do you have any reservations going through that process? Is there anything that you think could be done to make navigating that process while menstruating any easier for female athletes? Well, for me, because they normally take blood samples and also urine samples. I think that, okay, if you're in an environment, because they're always going to come and take your, 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 your blood samples or your urine samples. For that day, if you know that an athlete is on their menstrual cycle, you can take that, the blood for that day and then you revisit them another time and take the urine because for me, it is uncomfortable. I've, I've, I've been on my menstrual before when I had to, you know, see somebody and it's uncomfortable, you know, being in the room, even though it's another female, like you're uncomfortable because you don't want anybody seeing all of that. You really don't want anybody seeing that. So it is really uncomfortable when, because I remember in Paris Diamond League last year, I was on my menstrual then. And after I finished running, I was on the floor. I, I, I couldn't move. My stomach was, you know, I had belly pain and everything. I had to rush to the bathroom. So after rushing to the bathroom, you know, you, you're going to pee. You're going to do everything you have to do as a woman then. And then you have to go again and sure, drink water to, so that you can be able to give a sample. 
and sometimes it can be like hours in the in the in the doping control room and you're hungry you just compete you're hungry you want to go get something to eat so i really think that they can you know arrange for something else even if it's after when you go to the hotel or something because all they need is your urine it's not like you're trying to run away from it no you're going through your menstrual so and you're uncomfortable you're in pain like you're drained from everything so i really think that they can arrange something afterwards take the blood and then you know arrange for something else with the urine because they are going to be dumping control at the, the 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 hotel because actually i i got tested before they took my blood before i went to run and then they they take my urine after i run so they have ways of going around doing it right then so i was on my menstrual plus they draw my blood before i go and actually run the 800 meters so they basically trying to drain out all my iron before i go and run like no you can arrange for another day to do this I was there before that you you choose to do that when i'm like come on you can do better you know what i mean so i i really believe that they can arrange for another day or even cuz even at that time when i was there and my whereabouts so that I was in Paris, I got called, say I was back home. They tried to come and take my, my sample when I was not even there. But I, my address said I was in Paris. So you see, they, they have ways of going about doing it in, um, for other days. Like they can take it another time. And I really believe that they can do that. They just try to be like, look, I need your pee. So give it to me right now. That's basically what they're saying. Like, I don't care what you're going through. Give me that pee, you know? So basically, that's what's going on. <laughs> Definitely a lot of challenges for our female athletes to navigate and coach. Vassal, final question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, do coaches promote any sanitary products or have you ever had to, let's say, make a recommendation to an athlete whether to use, okay, a pad versus a tampon, which one might be, you know, more comfortable to run in, et cetera. Have you ever found yourself in that situation? I tend to use the brands which I buy for my girls. So it's, it's basically, I say, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm the guy who is, when I'm coming home, my suitcase has like, I buy a large pack with 72 sets thrown all over the suitcase. So anybody sees my, my suitcase wondering what is happening, but because I, I don't have a problem doing that. Um, so I said, okay, I always buy, like I buy always. I, 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 they seem to like it, it seems to work. I said, okay, this one. When I was growing up, you heard about Stay Free and Libres. So for me, like, even, even at, well, like for the school, I have like a pack of each. So I have a pack of each in the kit. So I said, listen, this is here, whichever one you want. For the painkillers, you get like four or five different brands of painkillers. So this is here, you choose whichever one you're comfortable with and you use it. But I try and give them options. Thank you very much for that, Coach Vasso. I am sure all of us females here are smiling to know that level of accommodation that you are extending to your female athletes. And we really hope that, you know, any coaches, persons who work with <laughs> athletes, you know, can take some. Who seems to be, you know, well ahead of the curve in terms of his progressiveness yeah. to his approach. Well, this has indeed been a very enlightening forum and hopefully you know, this is just the start of these conversations of this very important area of female athletes and navigating the menstrual cycle as we seek to change the narrative from something that is a taboo subject to one of creating solutions and safe spaces for performance for our women and girls. A uh, hearty thank you to our knowledgeable panelists, Olympia Natoya Gould, Dr. Gillian Lawrence, TTOC Project Coordinator, Risa Grant, Coach Michael Vassell, and sports journalist Trishana, Trishana McGowan. Now, on behalf of myself and the fellow moderator and project coordinator, Rashika Grant, and the entire Drive Face team, thank you so much for joining us here on YouTube.
And if you joined us late, you can watch the replay on our YouTube channel, of course, right here, the Dry Phase Media. You can also keep the discussion going on social media. Don't forget to tag us in all of your posts, all of your comments, because I know we, we don't have to stop here. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at The Dry Phase. We're also on Twitter at The Dry Phase JA. So feel free to use the hashtags TDP and Safe Sport. Follow us on all of these platforms because you don't want to miss any of the exciting updates the Drive Phase team has for you, some exciting plans in store. So on behalf of our entire team, first, I'd like to wish a very happy birthday to our technical guru, the man behind the scenes. You don't ever see him, but Mr. Tess Leroy Henry, his birthday is today. And we thank you so much for all of the support. You know, he's given up his birthday to come and share this time with us as we disseminate this valuable information throughout the region. So happy birthday to you, Teth Leroy. So on behalf of Teth Leroy and the other members of the team, project coordinator, Rashika Grant, co-coordinator, Mr. Dalton Myers, who was the moderator for some of these um, webinars, Karen Madden, Heather Bernard, Dr. Carol Long, Sharon Simpson, who was also a moderator for one of these webinars, webinars and myself. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening. Thank you and good evening.